on verse number 15. We'll be reading from there to the end of the chapter.
was that prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Mm -hmm. Now my mom was trying to get me as a five and six year old to think spiritually, so she would tell me that prayer uh, as she tucked me in and kissed me uh, goodnight, and then she left the room and shut out the lights and she left the room. And guess what part of the prayer I was thinking about as I tried to fall asleep as a five or six year old, if I should die before I wake. Very dark, very silent. Uh, I wish I could forget that part of the prayer. If, if I should die before I wake, ever since then I've had insomnia. <laughs> when I was down in Vista, I'd come stay the night with my mom, drive up to Vista, and I would complain every time I spent the night, man, I can't sleep here. And she would ask me, I don't know how you ever became such a light sleeper. And I thought to myself, I know why. <laughs> if I should die before I wake. That uh, prayer came from like the 17th century. And most of you know things were a little more stern back then, weren't they? So the 90s softened everything. Softened masculinity and even softened prayers. If you're a kid in the 90s, you were lucky because they changed the prayer. It goes like this now. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Please, angels, watch me through the night and keep me safe till morning light. Yeah. So much better breath for a type than if I should die before I went. <laughs> Agree, Jalen? No? So let's look at uh, this prayer uh, in verses 15 and 16, or let's look at, at what Paul says led him to pray this prayer. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. Now that's an interesting verse. What is evidence that we are really saved? God gives us a supernatural love for other believers, right? It's, it's something that just comes to us. Appreciation and love for other believers. So Paul said, I, I heard of your faith and and your love unto the saints, I believe that, that you are a part of the church, that, that you're saved, you're the body of Christ there in the city of Ephesus. And because of that, I'm so excited, verse 16, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then he gives us this prayer. Now, I am going to explain it because I think it needs to be explained if we're ever really going to appreciate it. But let me just say this, that once we get the cons uh, once we, we get the, the, uh, a little bit of understanding of this prayer, I don't think we'll ever fully understand until we get into heaven. But um, once we get some understanding of this prayer, the concept of the prayer isn't really hard. The concept of the prayer basically breaks down to three things. Number one, he prayed that believers would come to know God better. Amen. All right? That's a pretty easy concept, right? What Paul wanted for all of us is that we would come to know God better. Secondly, that believers would come to know God's riches. And thirdly, that we would come to know God's power. I like the way Paul prayed. Pray for me, Paul. I want to know God better. I want to know the riches of God. And I want to know God's power because I need it. Amen? Well, today we'll just look at the first request that Paul gave here. And we said the concept is this that we would come to know God better. So look at verse number uh, 17. Paul said, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that Paul wanted the Ephesian believers to be very cognizant about is their God is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means so much to us. I'm going to talk about this at the end of the message. But what a way to start a prayer. It gets all the momentum going for edification for us. It all starts with this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is also our God. 
Then he goes on to say that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Glory. He's not only the God of Jesus and us, but he is also in the same breath the Father of glory. And these things go hand in hand. The fact that he is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory means something very inclusive for all of us that we're going to talk about. But when we think about Paul starting the prayer and meditating on this fact that God is the Father of glory, what does that mean? He is the one who is all glorious and the source, the source of all that is glorious. So when Paul is praying for us, the fact that he's praying to the Father of glory means that Paul is hoping that this glory of God will visit us, that we will be participants in this glory that the Father is the source of to us. Amen? Amen? And we get to see, if you keep your finger in Ephesians, kind of how this works, again, because it worked this way for Jesus when he humbled himself and set aside uh, his prerogative to, to just act as God alone, but submitted himself to the Father as he took on flesh. Uh, all this was... Jesus' source of glory. So we see about this in a prophecy of him if you go to Isaiah chapter 11 and find verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. This is a prophecy of Jesus' coming 700 years before he came. Another thing that affirms the validity of Christianity, right? prophecy concerning Jesus, 700 years. It says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, this is speaking of the tribe of Judah, the lineage of Judah, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So it's talking about the Messiah, and look what it says in verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So, this God is also our God. This God is the Father of glory. And as you can see in Paul's thinking, the things that he did for the Lord Jesus, he is willing to do for us also. And that's why Paul is excited to pray, because he wants to unleash all that is glorious upon believers through his prayers from the Father of what? Glory. The Father of glory. Now we go and see in the prayer that he asks that we as believers get from God the spirit of wisdom and revelation, just like what we saw in Isaiah 11, 2. A lot of similarity there in this idea, in this concept. So look at verse number 17 again. We're just kind of stringing this prayer together. He's prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. God wants each and every one of us to have his spirit of wisdom and revelation in our lives. He's the source of glory. What is this glory that he wants to confer on you and me? The spirit of wisdom and revelation. What does he mean by that? Well, fortunately, uh, verse 18 kind of explains that prayer request. And what we're going to see, verse 18 uh, explains is the spirit of wisdom and revelation gives understanding and relevance to the revealed truth. So when God gives us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, what we are gaining from him is spiritual insight. 
In other words, all that is being revealed in the New Testament era, the completion of Revelation, is not obtuse to us. We will not be blinded to it like many people are. But when God gives you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, away goes the obtuseness. Away goes the blindness. And now all of a sudden, our spiritual eyes are open. The eyes of our heart are open. And we get it. We understand it. And not only do we appreciate the understanding of it and worship God for our understanding of these sublime things, but it also shows us the relevance of it in our daily life and in our daily uh, living out hope. Amen? Amen? So, Paul prayed that God gives us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. What did he mean by that? Look at verse 18. It's all one sentence. The sentence doesn't stop. In verse number 17, it goes on. And so this is kind of what he meant by this uh, prayer request. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And in verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. The spirit of wisdom and revelation gives us all that. So, it is enlightenment, look again at verse number 18, that the eyes of your understanding being light, enlightened. It's enlightenment and understanding, but it also gives us the relevance of all this truth, because not only is Paul interested that we have this, in, uh, that our understanding enlightened, but it goes on, that you may know what is. And that's the relevance. God wants us to know, not only to understand it, but to know what is as a result of this great revelation that we have and we can understand. Everybody get that a little bit? Okay. So, this type of phenomena is seen in Daniel chapter 5. If you want to keep your finger in Ephesians and go to Daniel chapter 5, uh, this can be you and me to some degree. Um, Daniel 5, verses 11 and 12. There is a situation where a rogue king was on the brink of being severely judged, and he saw a vision. It was the writing on the wall, literally, and he was very upset, and he wanted to know what the vision meant. Nobody had the wisdom and understanding to satisfy his desperate curiosity except for Daniel. And uh, Daniel had what we would call the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And uh, so we see that it's something that, that can really happen. So look at verses 11 and 12 of Daniel chapter 5. They summons Daniel because of this. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is what? The spirit of the holy gods. That's how they described it in their pagan understanding. And in the days of thy father, look at this. Just like Ephesians, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found where? In him. In him. That can be you and me. That's what Paul wants for you and me. That God would give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Here we see it acting out in, in, in human flesh and real time, in ancient time. Whom the king, Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say, the father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard senses and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So that's kind of a nice illustration of it, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you? I'd like to go on to my next point if you would just admit that. I had to work for that illustration. <laughs> All right. So, finally we see today that Paul sews all of these requests up that he started with in verse 17. And again, uh, 
this part of his prayer request is that we would come to know God better. That we would be able, as we continue to live out the Christian life on earth, get to know God better and better and better. And the way that we do that is we get more and more enlightenment and understanding of the truth that he's revealed to us. He gives us more and more understanding and as we understand it, we see the relevance of it, we get to live out and enjoy the what is of all of this truth. Verse 17, um, uh, or verse 18, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who are to believe. And we'll talk more about this next week. We'll break all that down for you. Are you coming back? Are you going to come see me next Sunday? Amen. Amen. I like the way you think. But what is so beautiful about what Paul is praying for us is that this all comes from deep and intimate knowledge of God. Look at Ephesians 1.17. Uh, all of this we see in the last phrase is in the knowledge of Him. Now this word knowledge is a very unique word in the Greek. It's not just regular knowledge, which is gnosis. This is super knowledge, which implies knowledge that comes from in, uh, intimacy. It is gnosis with a prefix put on it, epa, epigenosis. So this is super knowledge that comes as we get to really know God. As we, as we get to be convinced of all that He is as the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and as our God, as the Father of glory, who is all things glorious and the source of all things glorious that He wants us to have, including this Spirit that's mentioned in verse number 17, which is the spirit of what? Any Jeopardy music? Do, do, do. <laughs> Connie Hepney. First Lady Hepney. And Revelation. I was waiting for the whole thing out now. You only have to be the answer. All right. Um, so, in the 1611 King James Bible, in the margin, they actually have an alternate uh, translation of, in the knowledge of him. So, if you had a copy of the 1611 and looked in the margin, it would say this, because I have a 1611 and I looked in the margin, so you can believe me. This was not a Google search, big guy. I opened it myself and looked. And it says exactly this as an alternate reading, quote, or the acknowledgement of Him. So when we get so intimate with God, when we have the super knowledge, we say, yes, God, yes, God, yes, you are the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you are my God. You are the Father of glory, and you are glorious in everything and the source of glory to me. And so all of this is wrapped up in this intimate, deep knowledge that we should be having with God. So I said we would show again some relevance of these truths. And so what about Paul starting the prayer with this unwavering acknowledgement of who God is. He's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what, what is the relevance of that to us? Well, go to John 20 and verse 17. I want to keep your finger in Ephesians. But John chapter 20 and verse number 17. Remember what I said that because He is our God, that we can get from Him just like Jesus and experience Him just like Jesus. Look what Jesus says in John 20, 20 17. 
Jesus said to Mary, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father, and whose Father? Your Father, and to my God, and to whose God? See what I mean? If he's Jesus' Father and our Father, and Jesus is God and our God, we can expect from him what Jesus expected from him and got from him. Amen. That's the, the, the relevance of this. When we intimately know him, he wants us to experience him as the same God and Father Jesus experienced him as being. Secondly, though, he also said the Father of glory. You're in the book of John. Turn back a couple chapters to John chapter 17. And find verses 21 through 23. So Jesus said, your Father and my Father, your God and my God. Jesus also says, my glory and your glory. Has that dawned on you lately? His glory is our glory to some degree. To some degree. Look at verses 21 through 23. Jesus said concerning us, the church, that they all may be one in unison with us, Father, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and they also, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Look at this. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have what? Amen. Given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved me as thou hast, and has loved them. So it even gets into this area of love, as thou hast loved me. Same Father, same God. Same glory, same love is ours. Now you know why Paul started the prayer that way. That prayer gave him all the momentum that he wanted. All he needed to know was that and that his desire was that we would have it. And the way we have it is God giving us the spirit of, of, of wisdom and revelation so we can understand it and and be enlightened to it, and then see the relevance of it. We kind of see how wonderfully Paul prays. It's so beautiful, he just needs to explain it to us. Amen. But he's not here. He left a long time ago, so you have, I was going to say second string, but that would not even be accurate. You have 500th string, 5,000th string. You have Pee Wee Leaguer filling in for Paul. He's the pro. I'm the guy still trying to hit the ball on the tee. Amen? amen. Oh, don't say amen to that. I just want to, that is purely anecdotal. Purely anecdotal. So, he wants, God wants to share his glory with you. Our prayers can be more often like this rather than Paul's prayer. Our prayers can be more often like this. Dear Lord, so far today I am doing all right. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not whined, complained, cursed, or eaten any chocolate. I have charged nothing on my credit card, but I will be getting out of bed in a minute. And I think that I will really need your help then. Unfortunately, that's how so many of us relate to God. In such a superficial way as if Christianity is just us not making God mad today. Really? Is that the depth of our Christianity? We just don't want to get God mad at us by messing up. Is that our depth? Paul prayed that we would be a little deeper than that. Amen? Amen. Let's read verses 16 and 17. Take a minute to get back in Ephesians because we want to read it real loud and scare the devil away today. Ephesians 1, 16 and 17. 
what we covered today. So on the count of three, let's scare the devil right out of this place with this great truth. One, two, three, verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the intimate super knowledge of him. Now, I don't agree with the Eastern Orthodox Church, but I agree with what this one bishop says. And this is what I want you to get. We're wrapping up now. So listen carefully to me. Listen carefully because this is, this is our takeaway. And I want everybody to get this. Again, uh, for those of you who are viewing on Facebook, I do not align myself with Eastern Orthodoxy. But this is one thing that an Eastern Orthodox bishop said that I can sign on to. This bishop, by the name of Callistos Ware, wrote, Christianity is not merely a philosophical theory or a moral code, but involves a direct sharing in divine life and glory, a transforming union with God face to face. That's the, the, the epigenosis that we're talking about. And so when we think about our communion and our relationship with God, here's another quote that I got from a book I just finished reading. My painter friend, Jim Judge, randomly mailed it to me. It surprised me. He's never mailed me a book before. I didn't even know that he read. And I opened it up, and the title of the book was Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools. I said, hope he's not referring to me in the latter part of that title. <laughs> What's he trying to say to me? But it turns out to be one of the best books on prayer that I've read in a long time. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to send him a thank you card for lifting me up, thinking about his old friend and sharing this wonderful resource with, with me. If you can get a hold of it, I highly recommend it. Uh, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. It's not perfect. You've got to it's like eating fish, you've got to chew the meat and spit out the bones, right? It's not perfect, but man, it's awfully good. But when we think about our communion with God and, 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 and being so in touch with Him uh, by the truth that backs us up, for the audacity to be that close to Him, uh, this author ends his book like saying this, prayer does not emerge from knowing our needs, but from knowing God's heart. What will always keep Christianity interesting to us? Not a bunch of rules to follow. Not a bunch of service to wear ourselves out with to feel like we're worthy to God. What is it that keeps Christianity, both Christianity and our walk with God, an insatiable joy that we just have to have? What is it? It's not even having needs. It's knowing God's heart towards us. Paul wanted more than anything for you to know God's heart towards you. And once that is what you're after, when every day is an adventure to learn more and more about this heart of God that is towards us, like we've already talked about, uh, what's good for Jesus is good for us, that's his heart towards us, it never gets boring. It's always delight. And so today as you stand, I'm going to ask you just to pray a commitment to your prayer that you will recalculate in your Christian life from this day forward that when you get up tomorrow, you will not pray that prayer about not charging anything on your card or eating chocolate, but that you will pray a prayer before you get out of bed. Father, Father, you are the God of my Lord Jesus Christ and me. You are the Father of glory, and you are all glorious, and you are a source of all that is glorious to me. And start with that. That is God's heart for us. Amen? Start there. Get rid of this traditional Christianity that's as dead as driftwood on a beach. Get this, this intimate knowledge of God, and you will see 
your Christian life would be so wonderful. I need that. I'm preaching this message to me first. Let's stand and just pray a prayer right at your seat. Lord, I am recalculating. I am recalculating and I, I'm starting over from this day forward. Um, Paul's prayer has, has taught me what the secret is and, I, and I'm going to abide in that secret and, and live it out. And so just pray something like that right now and be expectant. Be expectant for God to do something in you that is so transformational that you can expect all that Jesus expected for the most part when he humbled himself and submitted to the Father uh, in his incarnation. Amen? Amen. And uh, to back all this up, we will sing this chorus, Reveal Your Glory in Me.